free. Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney, and I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell has about 57 lawyers. I'm the person who does this. Uh, I've tried to focus on this for a long time um, because I just think it, it, elder law, people that say, well, what is that exactly? Well, it's, it's, it's the law that deals with all of the issues that you deal with when you are getting to the point where you may be wanting to be collecting Social Security, where you're probably going to be retiring, and where you're actually starting to realize that you're going to die, right? Nice thing about older people is that everybody realizes they're going to die. Your kids never believe it, right? They, well, they know you're going to die. They just don't think they're going to die, right? But So your goal then becomes not to not die. Every once in a while, I have an estate planning person that says well, the plan is to kind of not die and say, okay, well, we'll try that, you know, but it doesn't work but it's really to live as well as you can until you die. Uh, and then to make sure after you die that whatever you have left goes where you want it to go. So um, I do a lot of work with folks who are, who are very concerned about Alzheimer's and they're older and they've got those issues. Um, but there's one issue that, that people are often really confused about and that's, so when do I take my Social Security or how do I take my Social Security or how does that work anyway, you know? Remember you used to get those statements at least once a year and they kind of, they'd say something at least about what your total was and what you're not, and you don't even get those anymore. Now you just kind of know there's something happening in the background. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit because there are some, well, I had one client who recently told me, he said, you know, I'm almost 66. He was working. He runs his own business. But he said, I'm going to start my, taking my payments right away because I want to get every dime that I can. Well, for him and for his wife, taking those payments right away may not have been the best way to get every dime that he could. So that's kind of one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So we're going to talk about my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, I often use these folks as my examples, and they look older than 65 because usually they are. So I, and I was hoping I could get them edited to look like 65 today, but I didn't have time. So Frank and Mary, and they are 66, and they own a house and they own it jointly, and the value of the house is $400,000, and they have a 401k that's worth about $300,000. They have joint bank accounts. So they don't have a lot in assets, um, and Frank has a pension that he's already getting of $1,000 a month, although he's still working, and Mary is still working, uh, and she's just got income of $1,000 a month. And their question is really, they're 66 now, and they haven't gone on Social Security early, but now they know that they're retirement age. They're kind of the official age, and so, sh the, so should they do it. And the answer to that um, involves a whole lot of factors, but among other things, it just involves some kind of math, some kind of basic math so that they can try to figure out what they should receive. And there isn't like a correct answer for everybody regarding any of this stuff, but it is a matter, I guess the theme of this is, it is a matter of doing the math. Um, the nice thing about Social Security, as you all know, it just keeps on going. Uh, it keeps on going until you die. So if you start with $10,000 uh, and you assume, ba and based on his historical numbers over the last 20 years, the average increase in Social Security for COLA, or the cost of living adjustment, has been 2.8%. If you assume that, then in 10 years you get $304,000. In 30 years you get a little over a million one. Um, and 30 years means if you started at 66 that you'd be 96, not, not definitely old, but not today overwhelmingly old. So it's a benefit that lasts for a long time, and as we'll discuss, it's a benefit that if you die and your spouse is alive, your spouse benefits. Um, so, so it, it, and, if, and your payments, if you start off with a payment that's just $2,000, counting those cost of living increases, um, in 10 years, the payment goes to 2,600, and in 30 years, it goes to 4,500. So it does kind of march along um, with the cost of living, and really kind of allows a lot of my clients to not not just to live, but to live pretty well because it supplements other income of theirs. Um, and then there is the survivorship benefit, which I just wanted to mention because I'm always amazed that many people don't realize it. Um, 
that if Frank, in this case, um, has, is getting Social Security of $2,000 per month based on the calculation of how much he worked and what, his, what the, so his Social Security number was, and Mary was entitled, because she had been working, to $1,200 a month because she simply hadn't been getting that much money uh, in, her, in her job. Um, um, Mary, upon Frank's death, jumps, can choose. She can choose whether, if her benefit is higher, she can keep it, or if Frank's benefit is higher, she can just jump and take his. So, it, so from, for her, the rest of her life, she can be getting Frank's benefit. Now, one of the reasons that you want to just keep kind of thinking about that is that's really key to thinking about whether it is worth deferring your benefit in order to try to get the highest possible monthly benefit or starting to take it right away. Because remember, when you're talking about getting the highest possible monthly benefit, it's for you, or if you die, it's also for your spouse, that she'll be able to get that highest benefit. So how do the benefits get calculated? I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, I could, but it's just a lot. It's a lot. So basically, at age 62, so because age 62 is the first year for which you can get benefits, Social Security will basically add, add up um, we'll basically look back and look at all of the Social Security-based money that you've paid. They'll take your highest 35 years of income. Um, they will apply a different percentage to the various amounts of money that you have earned. And I'll just mention, that. I'll show that just in a second. And the result is going to be called, what is called your primary insurance amount. And you want to kind of remember that term, primary insurance amount, or PIA. That's the amount that you will get paid when you hit full retirement age. Just not to waste a lot of time on this, but if you, if, if you were born in 1949 and, and you had gotten the maximum uh, in Social Security benefits every year, um, and then they applied this formula, they would find that your benefits would have added up to $8,000 per month, or $8,238 per month. They would take the first 600, 767 per month and give you 90% of that. They'd take the next big chunk of, of almost 4,000 and give you 32% of that, and then for the rest give you a very small percentage. So if you had been getting this maximum amount, your, your PIA would be $2,466. Um, for everybody who does this, that's what Social Security is going to do. They're going to basically take your income over your lifetime. They're going to apply different fact. They're going to reduce it to a, 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 a monthly number. They're going to apply certain little fractional factors to it and then, then assign a value to you. Um, and that's full retirement age. Full retirement age was always, when we were growing up, it was always 65. Now it is slowly creeping up. Uh, for Frank and Mary, who were both born in 1948, that's why they are now 66, um, the, the retirement age is 66. Um, it's going to stay there until people who were born in 1955, and then it's going to keep going up until 1960. As you know, when you read about Social Security and people talking about Social Security reform, this is the stuff that everyone is talking about needing to amend. Not about changing anybody's existing benefits, but about changing the age at which you're going to retire. And not about cutting people's benefits, but ra rather changing that COLA number, changing the inflation, the, the, the rate by which those numbers increase. Um, the effect of early retirement. You can also start getting these payments. Well, I shouldn't, shouldn't really call it early retirement, but the early taking of Social Security benefits. You can start taking the payments as young as age 62. But then if you are like Frank and Mary and your full retirement age is 66, at that time, you're only going to get 75% of what that, that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the PIA number was going to be, right? And once you're, once, you've, once you're in the system, although there is a provision of the system that says that within a year of the date that you decide to come in, you can change your mind and get back out again, right? But once you're in the system, you're in. And, and you can't kind of take it back. You can't start off at 62 getting 75% and then somehow be able to get up to that 100%. You're going to get all of your income for the rest of your life is going to be based on that 75% figure. And you're going to be getting your cost of living adjustments based on that. If you're at 73, it's 80, or 63, and your full retirement age is 66, it's 80%, et cetera. So there's a chart that just kind of shows you that. But once again, conceptually, uh, if you are retiring before full retirement age, you can do that.
but you're taking a, a, a smaller a percentage of what you would have gotten, and you're taking that percentage together with cost of living for the rest of your life. The flip side of that is this, the late retirement bonus. The government, of course, would really like you to not start collecting right away um, because they they're just would rather not be paying you that early. Uh, and so they've given you an incentive, and it's actually a very big incentive, and we're going to talk about some of those numbers for retiring later. So once again, uh, if, you are, if you hit full retirement age at age 66, and you wait until age 70 to take your first payment, not necessarily to, to file, but to take your first payment, we're going to talk about that difference in a little while, then your payments start at 132% of whatever your your monthly payment would have been. So that's really an important factor. And, and it's, it, it, once again, I just, we just used the, the full retirement age. If, you're, if, you retire at, if you need to retire at 67, those numbers change a little bit. The benefit is not as great. This has not changed for quite a while. There is some speculation that this too will change, that there'll be some additional incentives given to people to retire later. If you actually want to get your numbers, I'll also be uploading this to my YouTube channel. So if you want to actually go figure it out, your own numbers, you could actually go do that at any time. You can get not, you know, an estimate of what your, what your values would be right now if you haven't hit full retirement age yet. So that's the basic benefit. Now let's talk a little bit about the spousal benefit. Um, what Mary is entitled to, not by virtue of the work that she did, she's always entitled to that, but as an alternative, she's entitled to something while Frank is alive by virtue of being Frank's spouse. So, we're just going to play some basic numbers. If Frank's PIA is $2,000 per month, and if Mary's PIA, based on the work that she had done, is $800 a month, um, she can actually opt out of her benefit and take Frank's benefit instead. And this is one of those cases where you can actually, she can shift that. She can start off by taking Frank's benefit at $1,000 per month while she continues to work and therefore improve the eventual amount that she's going to get uh, or while she, while she waits and then later be able to claim more money if, 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 as basic, if, on her own. So she has the ability simply by virtue of being Frank's spouse to get 50% of what Frank would have collected as long as she waits until she is full retirement age before she collects that. So, one of the things that folks can do, Frank and Mary, let's take the Frank and Mary example. Frank and Mary are both 66. Frank has the option of filing but not collecting his benefit, right? He can file and suspend with Social Security. There's some specific language that needs to be on his form when he files and suspends. He can file and suspend. Um, if Mary, Mary, and then at that point, Frank is not collecting benefits, and therefore, the amount that he's ultimately going to get continues to increase. Remember, all the way up to 132% of his benefit when he is 70 years old. Um, Mary, though, if Mary wants to, because Frank has filed, can now file for her spousal benefit. That benefit is going to vary depending on how old she is, but if she's at full retirement age, it's going to be half of what Frank would have gotten. So Frank can file and suspend. And Mary, if she's not crazy about her job, can then retire, right, and simply take Frank's spousal benefit or take her own benefit, right, or take her own benefit. She really has, she has the, the choice, right? Or she can take Frank's spousal benefit um, for that period of time from 66 to 70. And then she can switch out of that and then, she can t and then if she's worked really hard, she can then take her own benefit plus those, ex those extra funds. But there, is no, uh, there are no extra benefit from Frank's waiting as opposed to filing and suspending. So the amount that she gets is going to be 50% of his PIA, 50% of the amount of money that he would have gotten had he retired at 66 even if he waits and, and, and doesn't start collecting until he's 70. So she never gets more in her spousal benefit by virtue of his waiting beyond 66, right? Um, what about Susie? 
we haven't talked about Susie. Susie was the fling that, he, that Frank had when he was in college in the 60s before he actually met Mary. And the question is, and then they were married for quite a while and then got divorced and then Frank, you know, had s settled down and then married Mary. They don't talk about Mary, about Susie very much. Nor do they want to. They don't want to hear from Susie and Susie really doesn't want to hear from them. But the main thing that Susie should know is that if she is divorced, right, and they were married for at least 10 years, and she is currently unmarried, currently unmarried, not that she hadn't married again, but that she may be married and divorced. So she is currently unmarried and she's at least 62. Um, then she can get the exact same spousal benefit that Mary could get. And it doesn't cause Mary's benefit to go down in any way. The two of them, the two, Sp the spouse and the ex-spouse can be both getting the exact same benefit by virtue of the fact that they were both lucky enough to live with Frank, right? Except that Susie has to have been married to him for 10 years. We're going to mention a little bit later on that Mary, even though she's currently married to him, has to have been married to him for at least six months in order to be able to get this benefit. But as I point out, that has no effect on Mary's benefit. So Susie has to have been married for 10 years she has to be currently single in order to get this benefit. And by the way, if she applies for Frank's benefit, there is no notice, notice that goes to Frank either, right, or to Mary. So no one's going to know that Susie is just kind of out there collecting her money. Um, survivor benefits. So there are your own benefits, right? There are your spouse's spousal benefits by virtue of being a spouse. And then there are your spouse's benefits by virtue of being the widow by virtue of being the survivor of you. How do the spousal benefits work? If Frank has not waited until he was 66, but claims his benefits early, you will recall that depending on when he claimed them, he would be getting a reduced percentage of what his full benefit was. And you may recall, we, I pointed out that the lowest percentage that he could get was 75%, right? That was if he claimed at 62 and his benefit was gonna, not gonna hit until um, 66. Well, if Frank, if, if, if Frank dies, right, um, and claimed benefits before his full retirement age, right, then Mary's benefit is based on Frank's benefit. Because remember one of the things that we talked about is that Mary is entitled to Frank's benefit if Frank dies. Except that, there's just this one little exception, exception to help out Mary. If, if Frank had started getting benefits right away at age 62, which meant he was only getting 75% of what he was entitled to. Mary can opt to take the higher of, the higher of what Frank could have claimed, um, or 82.5%. So she can get a little bit more, even though Frank was getting the minimum possible that he could have gotten. Um, if Frank claimed after full retirement age, then the survivor um, it can get the benefit of those delayed credits, right? So while as a spouse, the spousal benefit is always 50 no more than 50% of what Frank would have gotten at full retirement age, that PIA number, right? And doesn't, and, and she can't get 50% of the extra money he gets by virtue of waiting until 70. That's different if she's a widow, right? So if Frank has waited until 70, and to, to start claiming benefits and therefore has claimed the, 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 the maximum benefit of 132% of his PIA and drops dead the next day, Mary Clint can get the entire benefit for the rest of her life. Okay? So there are regular benefits, there are these spousal benefits, and then there are the survivor benefits. And now, how much does Mary get in her survivor benefit? Well, it's based on, as we've just talked about, it's based on what Frank's benefit would have been, right? But it is also related to when Mary claims it. So, if Mary claims early, even, so for example, say if Frank has gotten his whole, his PIA, whatever his PIA was, and say that was $2,000, if Mary claims early, that is before she is 66, then just like in the spousal uh, in the spousal deduction, in the spousal case, Mary can only get a fraction of what Frank would have gotten. If Mary claims at full retirement age, though, if she waits until full retirement age, then she can get 100% of whatever it was that Frank could have gotten. Um, 
Mary can always switch to this higher benefit after Frank dies, even if Mary had been collecting based on her own number and now wants to claim based on Frank's number, she can now switch to that higher number. Because when Frank dies, Mary does have to choose. This is also kind of a myth that, that, that if your husband dies, you can get his or her benefit while keeping your own. You can't. At that point, you have to pick. So there really is a, a significant reduction typically in people's social security benefits when one spouse dies just because that because one of the spouse's social security benefits is no longer arriving. By the way, I'm just going to mention one other thing. This is all assuming that Frank and Mary have worked in, in the private sector <coughs> and don't have public state pensions. Be, in, in, here in Massachusetts and in, I believe, seven other states, there are a whole special set of rules that apply if one of the spouses um, um, was part of the state retirement system because that handful of states decided, in many cases many years ago, that they were so much smarter than the federal government at investing money that they were just going to keep all the money in their retirement system and invest it their smart way as opposed to being in the federal system, right? But as a result of that, the federal government said, well, if you haven't paid into the system during your life, right, and you're getting a pension as a result of having been in a different system, right, then we're going to take some percentage of that pension right, and subtract it from what you can get in Social Security. I'm actually going to do kind of a specialized presentation just on that because it's very complicated. So, a couple of quick quizzes. Frank's PIA is $2,000 per month. Frank files at age 62. So he is going to be getting 75% of his PIA or $1,500 a month. Frank then dies. How much is Mary's survivor benefit? The answer is, depends. Depends. The maximum that she can get, remember, uh, because of this exception to the rule, is 82.5% of 2000 or 1650. But the question is, has, is Mary waiting until she's 66? If she waits until 66, then she can get all 1650. If, for example, she files early, and by the way, for a survivor benefit, you can actually file before age 62. You can file as young as 60, or if I recall correctly, if you're disabled, you can file as young as 50. Uh, if she files at age 60, her benefit is only 71.5% of that number of 1650, or $1,180. So to figure out the answer to the question, you always have to know, you have to know when you, th that Frank died, you also have to know, though, when Mary is taking the benefit. Quiz number two, Frank's PIA is $2,000. Frank files at age 70, and therefore his benefit is 132% of that, or $2,640. Frank dies the next day. Poor Frank is always dropping off in my case. How much is Mary's survivor benefit? If she is 66 or older, her whole benefit is $2,640. If, for example, she is only 60, her benefit is 71.5% of that, right? That's like her worst case. And once again, those numbers will last for the rest of her life, plus the COLA, plus the cost of living increases, okay? Uh, and that's a few random rules about these, all of this. Um, in order for you to be uh, entitled to a survivor benefit, you have to have been married for nine months. Right? This was to avoid some of the issues with um, um, people kind of trolling in Florida for people with a lot of Social Security money. Um, uh, you, the survivor has to be at least 60 right, or 50 if disabled, even to get the reduced benefit. Um, and, you need to be, and the survivor needs to be full retirement age in order to get the full benefit. Um, in order for um, Mary to get this benefit, if she was, if, she, if, in order for her to get the widow's benefit, she cannot have remarried, this is a piece of trivia, before age 60. If you remarry um, before that age, you lose the benefit. If you wait, um, you actually get to keep the survivor benefit even though you're married to a new person, right? Uh, and remember the, year, the 10 years for Susie, right? 10 years, Susie can get both the, 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 the um, um, the, the spousal benefit and the survivor benefit, as long as she was married to um, Frank for at least 10 years. And as long as she didn't remarry, as long as she is not married 
um, at the time that Frank dies. So, with all that information in mind, so when do you apply? Um, the information that I gave you is kind of one factor, but you can see how it plays into all of these issues, right? One of your questions is your health. Uh, if, you, if you are not well, and once again, a lot of the work that I do is with people who are very concerned about just being not well, and whether they have Alzheimer's or they have whatever, um, and they're not gonna, they may not live very long. If you're not well, then it may make sense to take the lower benefit, even the, you know, the full retirement benefit or, or the PIA or something lower than that, because the extra money that you're getting every month, it takes a while for that to catch up with the fact that you're getting that extra money per month by virtue of having not gotten any money in some earlier years. So if you're 70, you start off getting 132% of whatever you would have gotten per month but at the same time, you got zero of what you would have collected if you collected starting at 66, for 67, 68, and 69. Um, those lines actually cross at about age 81. So if you think that you are going to live past 81 and, and, and there are no financial issues, right? If, you've got, if you don't just like desperately just need the money because the point of this is you know, in the long run, we're all dead. I mean, the, you know, and you're not just doing this for your kids. And, and when you die, the money stops. It isn't like your kids are going to get a bonus because you died early, right? So if you're, if you're not healthy, then you just may decide that you want to start taking the benefits early. But remember, when you're thinking about that, the question is not how long are you going to live, but how long are you or your wife going to live, especially if you're the one with the higher number, right? Because if you defer in order to get that higher number, what you're doing really is you're preserving that higher number until the last of the two of you dies, right? So if you're in the classic man-woman situation, most of my older clients are women, right? Um, the men just died. They're all type A and they drop dead. And then the women kind of live on and have Alzheimer's kind of later in life. And, and, but if, if you're in that kind of situation, well then, you know, you, you may want to think about that. If one of you is going to live for a long time, then you may want to defer, unless there are strong, immediate financial reasons not to do that. Same thing with life expectancy. If, you know, you, you're trying to figure out your own health, but you're also looking at the health of your parents and of your, brothers, your older brothers and sisters and saying, so, you know, how am I going to figure out that equation? Uh, the need for income, obviously. Um, if you really need the income early, then you may be wanting to take the money. But I'm going to go back to the example that I started off with, my friend who had just told me, who owns a business and was just going to start taking these checks. It would keep working because you don't, he's 60 for retirement age, so he doesn't get penalized dollar-wise for being on Social Security and still working. Um, but the, but the, the issue for him was he said, I, I said, but, but, but Bobby, you have a lot of savings. I knew, that he, I knew them. He had quite a bit of savings. He, had a lot of, he said, yeah, but... If I pull that money out, I'm going to have to pay tax on it, right? I have money in my 401k and my IRA, and if I want to supplement my income, and this is really appropriate for people who are going to retire and take their money, if I want to supplement my income, if I pull my money out of my IRA or my, or my 401k, I'm going to have to pay tax on that. And I said, yeah, Bobby, but the, the issue is you're going to pull this money out and pay the tax, but you know somebody's going to pay that tax sooner or later. So you think you have $300,000 in that IRA, but you don't. I mean, you really only have, after tax, $200,000 in the IRA, right? So the question is, what's going to give you the best return? Keeping that $200,000 you know, or whatever in that IRA over the next four years while taking your Social Security, right? Or using some of that IRA money while guaranteeing that for the rest of your life that Social Security check is going to go up by 32%, right? So you really want to weigh that out. It is not an obvious, the, that, the, that question of whether to take Social Security versus using some of your tax deferred or other money does not have an obvious answer. You really want to think that out. Now, you don't want to think that out just talking to your lawyer, right? You really want to have, think that out talking to your financial planner so that you can really do some projections regarding what you really think your investments are in your IRA or 401k are going to do. How does that compare to this? It's a math question, but just don't assume it. That's all. And I guess one of the other questions is do you plan to work? And really that's related 
to the, to the, uh, the need for income. If you're planning on working anyway, so you're only kind of taking this money because it's there, and so you don't want to be throwing it away, well, then you really should be thinking of your Social Security more as an investment and say, well, I don't, if I don't need to take it right now, and I know that I'm getting this tremendous return on the money, maybe I want to wait. And then what are your survivor needs? So you want to kind of consider all of those things. But why delay? Just to once again, as, as an example, as an example, um, if, you're, if you're claiming at age 62, you're getting 75%, right? Um, and therefore you're getting $1,850. If you're claiming at age 70, and this is assuming that your, that your PIA was $2,466 at age 66. If you were claiming at 70, you're getting $3,255, right? And it grows relatively quickly, right? The, the, your benefit at age 70, if you claim at 62, is 2,300. If you claim it at se in, and, your, and your benefit at age 70, if you claim at age 70, is 4,000. Look at that number at 80. Right? If you had claimed at 62, you're getting $3,000 a month. If you had waited until 70, you're getting $5,000 a month. They are, they, are significantly, they are significantly different numbers. So just go back to Frank and Mary. You know, you've got that house that's worth $400,000. Um, you've, got, you've got some, you've got a, he's, he's got some 401k money, so he does have the ability to supplement his income to the extent that he wants to, right? Um, just a couple of other issues, taxes, if you folks are pr pretty much pro probably all aware of this. Um, the way that the, your, your, your Social Security is subject to some taxation, the way that gets done, you want to talk to your accountant about what your numbers would look like, right, is that there's a calculation of your provisional income, uh, which is the income that you've, that you've earned uh, plus one half of your Social Security benefit plus your tax exempt interest. That's a bizarre little addition. Uh, and then the, you're, you're based on that, there's a calculation of how much you're going to be paying. And you are going to be paying um, on up to 50% of your Social Security mo money, depending on what bracket you're in. For the specifics, you really need to just kind of talk to your accountant about it. Um, one other issue, though, that I just want to talk about, because this is the issue that I talk about with people so often. Um, as I had mentioned when I started, a lot of the folks that I talk to are doing planning because they're concerned about Alzheimer's or other diseases that cause dementia. Because the basic issue when you're retiring is that Medicare will take care of you if you get any major disease except Alzheimer's disease or the others that cause dementia. You get cancer and you need operations and you need chemo, Medicare is going to cover all of that, right? You have dementia and you have a little trouble dressing in the morning or you need someone to kind of watch you so you don't walk out on the street, Medicare is going to pay none of that. Um, it is Medicare, as, as I remember I did a recent, I, an article on this so I was doing some of the research on it. And when Medicare was created in 1965, over 30% of all people in America over 60 years old were poor, were poor. Right? It's just hard to conceive of that now. Right? That number now is under 7%. And the major reason, I would suggest, is Medicare. In 1965, when Medicare was created, Social Security had already been around for 30 years, and still over 30% of all Americans over age 60 were poor. And now it's under seven, right? So Medicare takes care of everybody except the players who have Alzheimer's. But if you have Alzheimer's, then you have to play this, this game in order to qualify for government benefits. Um, and the way that game works is as follows in Massachusetts. And, and once you understand that, I'm going through this because it affects, it does have an effect on the way you think about Social Security. So Frank and Mary, that was their situation. Remember, Frank has an income of $1,000 a month in a pension, and Mary has a, a thousand in, in job income. And then Mary gets sick and needs to go to a nursing home. Oh, let me do a quick quiz. If Mary goes into a nursing home, and you saw the assets that Frank and Mary have, how many of you think that, that Frank and Mary are going to need to spend a significant amount of their money on nursing home care? If Mary is in a nursing home and needs to qualify for MassHealth, in order to do that, because Medicaid is, is, is health care for the poor as opposed to Medicare, which is health care for the old, right? Uh, Ma Mary has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. But, but, Frank, who is still living at home, can own the home 
as long as it has an equity of less than $800,000, can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $117,560, like you know the, the 401k that he has and all of that cash, he can keep up to that amount. But most importantly, he can have infinite income. He can have infinite income. There is no income test for the spouse in Massachusetts. And under Mass so under Massachusetts regulations, what Frank and Mary could do if Mary needed nursing home care is Mary could simply transfer the house to Frank, as long as it has an equity of less than 800,000. She could transfer all those cash assets to Frank. Remember, Frank had the 401k, but they had some joint asset. They had some cash in common. You transfer everything to Frank. Frank can go out and buy an annuity, which is an income stream from an insurance. An annuity is a, you all know this, but an annuity is a contract with an insurance company. You give them money. In return, they, reach, they promise to give you back an amount of money on a regular basis for a term. As long as the annuity that Frank purchases calls for the regular payment back to him monthly over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, and remember, he's 66 years old, so his life expectancy is 15 years. Uh, as long as he purchases that kind of annuity, he can purchase it in any amount. He can take all of his cash, thereby, or at least the amount that puts him over 117,000 and buy that annuity, and a day later, Mary can qualify for Mass Health because she has less than $2,000 because she transferred it all to Frank. He owns the house. He has cash or cash equivalents of less than $117,560, right? So, as it applies to the Social Security case, right? And this is important if you think that this may be an issue for you. The issue is once Mary has qualified for MassHealth, which she will, the MassHealth rule is all of her income needs to go to the nursing home. All of her income needs to go to the nursing home, right? Um, Frank's income, Frank can keep his income. But Social Security is income. So reverse this. Assume that Frank was going to the nursing home and we shifted everything to Mary, right? But she had, but they had spent down some of their cash or cash equivalent assets because they had followed my advice. They had said, well, we're gonna balance everything out here. We're gonna wait until Frank is as old as is 70 before he starts collecting so that he can get the maximum possible benefit. And therefore, we're gonna use our other cash, right? So now Frank's got this big check that's coming in if Frank qualifies for nursing home care, Frank's check is going to the nursing home, right? Mass Health will pay the difference between that check and whatever the nursing home bill is, right? That's good. So if Mary went, and Mary had a very, very low income, that would all work fine. But if Frank went, it wouldn't work so fine. So to the extent that you have health issues, once again, look at your family, look at your own health that you maybe want to, concern to, may want to be concerned about. To that extent, it may profit Frank and Mary to keep flexibility by keeping their money in cash or cash equivalents that they can move around in the event that one of them needs nursing home care. Um, there are a lot of issues, like, and I guess I use the mass health example just by way of example to say, you're li you know your lives. You know, I can tell you some general principles, right? But only you know kind of how all of these things fit into your life. The real answer is you want to figure it out. You want to do the math. When you're doing the math, as I mentioned this before, don't count on your lawyer to do the math. Most of us went to law school because we couldn't do the math, right? Or we didn't want to, right? So work with your financial advisor and your accountant, but talk to your lawyer to see what the correct structure is. If you want to see this show again, that's my YouTube channel. Just, you, can just, you can use that complicated thing, or you can just Google Elder Law Frank and Mary and see this or any of the presentations that I have done regarding a number of elder law issues. And this is my, the goal. This is my goal, um, is to help everybody sleep well at night. If none of this is relevant to you, then you just kind of came out for a while and you get to use the, have the cookies here at Sherbin Commons and that was great. If it is relevant to you, then maybe it's just helped you clarify the things that you need to think about. Thank you very much.